Hello, my name is Bill Sellers. I'm the president of National History Academy and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's live presentation with Brown v. Board of Education National Historic Site in Topeka, Kansas. Um, this is a continuation of our series of, um, of, of different uh, live virtual site visits to defining sites of American history. And um, you, I'd also like to, to mention that National History Academy is, um, is about to launch its summer programs this July. We've got four weeks of, uh, we're going to have about 15 different programs that we're going to offer for high school students. Uh, cases that were developed by Harvard Business School, Professor David Moss. Uh, so you'll study through the case method, uh, one case a week. You can do one week or, or multiple weeks. We'll have uh, different workshops. Um, uh, you know, one on how to be an historian, one on, uh, 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 well, one very similar to what we're going to be talking about today in, uh, in concert with, um, with Little Rock uh, Central High School. Uh, we'll have a series of four events with them. We've got a, another event with the Medal of Honor Museum. Uh, some, some very exciting things. So if you're a high school student or you know of a high school student, you can check out our website at nationalhistoryacademy.org. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Katie Smoller, our uh, Director of Education. Uh, Katie's currently a high school teacher in, in uh, uh, Hammond, Indiana at Gavitt High School, and she's worked with National History Academy since 2018. She was one of our first teachers in the, in the first class of uh, our residential program, a five-week uh, residential program in Virginia where students use uh, site visits, uh, are exposed to speakers, study the cases, engage in debate. And uh, last year, she helped put together our high school programs, uh, online programs, and she is again this year, but uh, we're thrilled to have her on the team. So Katie, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Bill. And welcome everyone. It is my pleasure today to introduce Dexter Armstrong. Dexter is a park ranger that has worked for the National Park Service for approximately six years. He currently works at Brown v. Board of Education National Historic Site, where he serves as a frontline interpreter. He has the privilege of being able to facilitate conversations regarding race and racism in America, structured around the history and legacy of the 1954 Supreme Court case that changed the country forever. Well, thank you very much, Katie, and, and good afternoon to everyone, uh, no matter where you are. Currently, I'm in Topeka, Kansas, um, in, in, in a great home. Uh, unfortunately, we are teleworking much like half of the country nowadays, but, but hopefully getting open back to our site uh, here shortly within the next couple of weeks. But with that, I do want to go ahead and share my screen and thank you all for, for being here, but also thank you all for, for having me. <clears throat> uh, as far as a special guest and, and to speak to you all about our site. Um, so from there, just to kind of give some kind of technicalities, first and foremost, my name is Dexter Armstrong. Feel free um, as we're, we're talking, as you're watching me on Facebook Live, uh, feel free to call me Ranger Dexter, or you can just call me Dexter. No harm, no foul. If you don't call me a Ranger, that's absolutely fine. And much like Katie said, I am a, a park ranger at Brown v. Board of Education National Historic Site here in Topeka, Kansas. And, and one last thing I do want to just kind of uh, be completely transparent about, I do have a miniature pincher right here laying here asleep for the moment. However, much like people wherever you are at right now are coming back home from work and things like that. So she might start barking. So she may join me up here in my lap to, to have her stay quiet for a moment um, as she starts to bark and as people come home. But if not, uh, you won't see her the entire time. She'll lay here asleep. Uh, but with that, without further ado, like I said, Dex, Dex Armstrong is my name. Work for the National Park Service. And a lot of people, when they think about the National Park Service, um, they think about those natural sites. Places like your Yosemite, your Yellowstones, your Great Smoky Mountains, all kind of things like that. But what people don't realize is the National Park Service consists of over 400 national park units throughout the country. Um, you have places that, that most people don't even know that they're in a national park site unless they see the emblem that's on our sign within that picture or right here on our shirt. Uh, but places, if you've ever been to, for instance, if you've ever been to South Dakota, Mount Rushmore with the president's faces, that is a part of the National Park Service. If you've ever been to New York, seen the Statue of Liberty, that is a part of the National Park Service. If you've ever been to Washington, D.C., seen the Washington Monument, um, the, the Lincoln Statue, or even just the White House itself, 
those are part of the National Park Service within themselves. Um, and as mentioned, there are over 420 National Park units and they consist of historic sites, battlefields, seashores, national parks, monuments, the whole shebang. And personally, I've had the pleasure and honor of working in five of them. And, and before I even say the five, just wanted to let you all know from Charlotte, North Carolina, just give a little history about myself from Charlotte, North Carolina, got my opportunity to work in the National Park Service as I attended school at Tuskegee University um, in Alabama. Uh, but with that experience, I got to work in the National Park Service and in order, I have five parks under my belt. The very first one um, is going to be the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee. And yes, that is a kangaroo. Why somebody brought one, I have absolutely no clue. Uh, but they brought it and afforded me the opportunity to be able to hold it right then and there um, while they did some horse riding. Next one is Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota, uh, where it was negative 15 degrees, if I'm not mistaken, at the moment of this picture. So it was fairly cold. Cape Hatteras National Seashore in North Carolina, where I'm from, the North Carolina part of it, where it has the highest lighthouse in North America, standing at 197 and a half feet tall, with over 257 steps to get to the top or to that landing to see out. And usually I can do it in about two and a half minutes. Next is Brown v. Board of Education National His Historic Site, where I currently am now. And then last but not least, Denali National Park and Preserve in Alaska. And a lot of people, when they ask and find out I'm a park ranger or find out about the different national park sites that I've worked in, <clears throat> they actually usually ask me, which are my favorites? Out of the five that I worked in, which one is my favorite? And what I usually have to say is I give it to two of them, one of which being the Great Smoky Mountains. I say that because without the experience there, none of this would have been possible. And I say that because, as I mentioned, from Charlotte, North Carolina, had absolutely no clue about the National Park Service. Couldn't tell you about camping, wildlife. I can tell you about sirens, jumping fences, playing hide and go seek, things like that. So with that experience, it kind of set the bar high for everything. And then, of course, Denali National Park and Preserve on the opposite side. Just looking at the scenery, uh, my mother being 55 years old at the time had never been on a plane, but because I worked there, she actually came to see me and I was the first person in my family to ever step foot in Alaska. So all kind of different experiences. So that just kind of gives you my resume behind uh, the kind of things that I've done, but also want to let you all know that throughout this conversation or throughout this discussion, I will be asking questions for, for both the people that are on the Zoom call, but as well as for those on Facebook. Uh, for Facebook, some of those times in which I ask questions, we'll be able to pull questions or answers from you all. And, and if you have questions, we'll save those towards probably the end of the presentation. However, what you'll probably see me do is as I ask questions, those that are on the Zoom call, as we kind of discussed before, they'll be answering some of the questions and they're going to be coming from genuine answers. So, uh, like I shared with them even prior to, to meeting everybody, um, hey, uh, no research needed, don't do anything. I want genuine answers. So you may hear me call people's names throughout the presentation that you all can't see. However, they will be answering to kind of help the conversation stay along. So along with that, just moving to my next slide, what I'll say is you're going to see a picture of a group of individuals, including myself, the centennial year of the National Park Service. That's 2016, meaning the organization had reached 100 years that it, was a lot, that it has been here, 100 years. And what I will say is, looking at this picture, can anybody find me? And with that, how did you find me? And those on Zoom, feel free to unmute yourself and let me know how you found me. And based off of that, that lets me know that you can actually see my PowerPoint as Well, I think I see you right in the center. Right in the center, man. All right, perfect. Tell me honestly, Bill, how did you see me? How did you find me? You know, so I think, uh, I think you were the only African-American face, at least in the first six or seven rows. 
Man, absolutely. And actually, you're probably the only one in uniform, honestly. There's one, one black gentleman in the very back on the left-hand corner, uh, one of our SCA interns. Uh, so not, not necessarily in uniform for the National Park Service, but served as our intern or one of the interns. And thank you very much, Bill. And that also let me know that you all can see my PowerPoint as well. So I appreciate it, man. Uh, but on that, a lot of people, a lot of people say different things as far as being able to find me in in my picture or in this picture as well. And Bill, I'll say, go ahead and mute because it will highlight you if you don't. So with that, perfect. With that, a lot of people will find me different ways. Some people say they'll see they found me because of my hat. I don't know how. Uh, other people say they can see me just because of my smile, which is typically how I find myself as well. Plus, I know what I look like. Uh, but then last but not least, much like Bill said, because I'm the only black person in the picture. And with that, with thinking about time frame and even the reason for this, this call or, or this presentation and just diving further into our discussion and presentation, thinking about maybe let's say 67 years ago, putting us about probably until about 1954 exactly, let's go 68 years just to be on the safe side putting us about 1953. With that, if we were in that time frame, do you think you would see anybody that looked like me in this picture? And nobody has to unmute at all, I will answer the question. It's no, and there's a reason for that. And that reason is because things were segregated within this country. And just to kind of give you a brief history and a synopsis, because I don't know if everybody on this call, some, some of us that's on this call has been away from school for a while. Some of us might not know anything about segregation. Some of us might have not been paying attention. Some of us might know it all about. However, just to make sure everybody's on the exact same page, just want to kind of give you a brief synopsis of what segregation was and what it looked like within this country. Segregation within itself was separation amongst races, depending on color and all that kind of stuff. And throughout this country, depending on where you stayed, segregation looked a little different. But to sum it all up, basically one race of individuals had some, a group of things, another individual or a group of individuals had another something of things. So meaning things that were segregated throughout this country, things like water fountains, hotels, restaurants, buses, uh, neighborhoods, essentially everything that you could think about was separated based off of race. And the way one would tell things were segregated without signs that said white in color or no blacks or whites only, without those signs, usually you can tell that by the quality of whatever that you were dealing with. So let's utilize water fountains. So in layman's terms, white individuals had a pearly white water fountain, Black individuals had a rusty water fountain, and as long as they both had water fountains, this was okay. And this was made okay by an 1896 court case by the name of Plessy v. Ferguson. A lot of people that come into our sites usually will say, I've never heard of Plessy v. Ferguson. However, they've heard of the saying that goes with segregation. So putting all this together, that saying is separate but equal. A lot of people don't realize that that is the verdict of that 1896 court case, Plessy v. Ferguson said, that said that as long as both entities received the exact same thing, it was considered separate but equal. And putting that into play within this presentation, it looked a little something like this right here. But in real life, more like this. And when we have people come into our site here at Brown v. Board of Education National Historic Site, people are hit exactly with that reality as soon as they walk into our door. And they're faced with these signs, which help narrow the, the thought process of what they're about to learn and what they're going to be talking about within our site. And for some people, it hits them differently. So for some individuals we have that come into our site, some people, it goes over their heads, whether it's due to the fact that they're not from this country, so they have no clue about segregation. For some people, that might be too young to not understand it. So we do have third graders, fifth graders that come into our site. For some people, it's unfortunately a blast back to their past. We've had individuals that come into our site that get no further than those pillars that are sticking out and say, yeah, I, I can't handle this. I'll see you all tomorrow. And then unfortunately, we have some people follow the signs. 
But nevertheless, this gets you in the zone of thinking about that 1896 court case Plessy v. Ferguson that said segregation was absolutely legal. And as mentioned, it found its way in so many different aspects of life. However, one that we're going to be talking about right about now is the school system. And this is how it looked throughout the country, especially in the South, but this specific display is to that of South Carolina, where white students went to the one on the right-hand side, black students went to the one on the left-hand side. And just to kind of give you a real life picture of these, that's the black school. That most of the time where they went to this one room shack with kind of no indoor plumbing, books, resources, you could have been in the first grade learning next to second through 12th graders, from a teacher that might not even had a degree themselves. And you could have been learning basic math or reading from, uh, from them right beside mom or dad. In comparison to that all white school that would have had all those things, books, resources, indoor plumbing, adequate amount of funding, good teachers, buses, the whole shebang. At the end of the day, they said, as long as you both had the exact same, this was considered separate. And just to ask a basic question within itself and feel free to answer within Facebook Live in that chat. Um, but does this picture look equal at all? It's a basic question, basic question. And the answer is going to be no, it doesn't look equal. However, a bigger question I would give you is, could separate but equal ever be equal? And yet again, feel free to answer that in the chat. Um, but with that, I will ask one of the people on our Zoom call, and I have no problem calling on people. So with that, Nicole, if you're still right there, with that question, just a simple answer from you, could separate but equal ever be equal? No. No. And if I can challenge you just one brief moment, why? Um, our implicit biases are sort of always going to get in the way and it's impossible to create two things that are going to be exactly equal. I love it. I love it. Thank you very much. What I'll say is I will be back to you, but I, what I'll tell people, even when I have this interface uh, in person, please keep that same mindset, that same energy, because I'm going to push like crazy here shortly. Now, with that chant jumping, um, that's this, this setup, as I mentioned, this is how it looked in South Carolina and throughout the South specifically. However, here in Topeka, Kansas, it looked a little something like this right here. So if I were to ask this same exact question of which one is the white school, which one is the black school? Amy, could you tell me which one you think and why? Uh, and without doing any reading or anything like that, just which one you think is the white school, which one is the black school, and for the people at home, feel free to put it in the chat as you think as well. Um, I would say that the one on the right might be the white school because it looks a little bit fancier with the portico. Um, it looks maybe a little bit um, newer, and so mm -hmm. that's what I might say is the white school. White school on the right hand side, black on the left. All right, Amy, so stay, stay unmuted for me, but I'll show you the real pictures and see if your answer still is still the same, all right? So here we go. Real picture of the one on the right hand side. Real picture of the one on the left hand side. Together. Which one is the white school? Which one is the black school, Amy? So I'd still probably stay with, it was pretty quick, but I would still probably stay with what I, oh, sorry. Yep. And one more. Yep. Um, so this one that you have on the screen looks a little bit newer, actually, in which case if it's newer, it might make me change my idea to being the white school and that it was more recently um, built with probably newer amenities. Gotcha. Okay, so so just, just to make sure I'm understanding, Amy, you've switched your answer saying the one on the left-hand side, which was the last real picture that I showed, is the white school. The one on the right-hand side would have been the black school. Right? Correct. Yeah, perfect. And then very last question, and I'll do this one to Michelle. A lot of people will say, okay, it's kind of hard to tell from the outside. So let's go inside. So Looking at the two separate pictures that I will be putting on the screen, keeping in mind that I do know that they're segregated based off of color, 
and we're going to be looking at a second grade class, which is the all black class in comparison to the one on the, 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 the fifth grade class, which is the all white school. So keeping those things in mind, meaning I already know that they're segregated and you're looking at different age students. Tell me what do you see that is unequal or unfair? And, and I'm saying stretching that C part. So meaning, don't tell me what you're expecting. Don't tell me what the difference is, but what do you actually see? So expecting, oh, well, they may have books, but I know they're old books. You can't tell it because you won't be able to see the dates. Well, and then the difference. Well, the white school has a door, the black school doesn't. That's just a difference. So Michelle, I'll show you these two separate pictures and you tell me what you think. Okay, well, obviously the picture on the left-hand side has the black students and the picture on the right-hand side has the white students. Yep, so other than that, and keep in mind that you're looking at a second grade class, which is the one on the left compared to a fifth grade, which is the one on the right. I this is very hard. <laughs> um, Gosh, I'm not, I guess I'm not sure. No worries, no worries at all. So with that, and, and, and I'm glad you said what you, and, and like I was telling everybody on Facebook, genuine responses. And these are the responses in which we get our site as well. But just to, just to push a little bit, not, not to you necessarily, Michelle, but mm -hmm. as a whole, as we're listening to this, remember we're talking about a time of segregation where, where the, the status quo was black students had worse than, and it should be obvious. However, right here within this picture, it's not as obvious as a lot of people think. And that's absolutely fine. And that's because of the way Topeka, Kansas did things. So it's more of a trick question of what I'm asking. And the reason that is, is because if they both were second grade classes or both fifth grade classes, you wouldn't be able to see anything that was unequal or unfair in regards to resources. And that's because Topeka would have provided them the exact same books and the exact same resources to the point where black teachers were sitting on the same committees as white teachers to ensure that. So if we're talking about a time of 1949 and white schools were going to get a math book that was from 1949, black teachers would have said, man, that's cute. So are we. We're not going to get your hand-me-downs from 48. We're not going to get a book that's irrelevant from 1921. We're going to get the exact same books at the exact same time and the same resources. Speaking about those teachers, most of your black teachers were overqualified with master's degrees and PhDs in comparison to white teachers that had their bachelor's degree. And then last but not least, a lot of people will talk about the desk in the black schools. So it kind of hits at the funding because the, the schools in the South, typically, the, especially the pictures that I just showed you with the South, for every black student, they would have provided $73 and compared to $179 per white student. Whereas in here in Topeka, Kansas, they provided them exact same amount of funding. It was then up to the principal to kind of divvy out where that funding went. So putting the desk in perspective, let's say you're the principal at that school and saw that your ceiling was leaking in comparison to your desk looking worn and torn as a principal, you better take care of that ceiling first, then worry about these desks a little later. So just putting it in perspective, but revealing the answer behind the first question that I asked when I started talking about Kansas, behind which one's the white school, which one's the black school. The one on the right hand side, Randolph School, is actually was the all white school at one time. So I think, Amy, you, you did have it right at the very beginning, but no worries, no worries. A lot of people do the same thing, but Randolph School was the all white school at one time. It is still an active school even today, uh, meaning kids are still probably at school or went to school today. Um, it is integrated, meaning anybody can go there that wants to go there but it did, did serve as the all white school at one time. And Monroe School, the one on the left hand side, served as that all black school. Um, and with that, talking about Monroe School, that all black school at one time, it has closed uh, nowadays as a school actually closed in 1975. However, we as Brown v. Board of Education National Historic Site, myself and some of, and, and my colleagues, have the pleasure and luxury of working in Monroe School that school that was one of four of segregated black schools within Topeka, Kansas, where most of the, the floors throughout the building, most of the walls throughout the building, the entire outside of the building, every single water fountain minus the pipes themselves, the fire extinguisher ports, and even the fireplace, 
All the things I just mentioned are original to this building built in 1926 specifically for black students. So to put everything that I just mentioned in context, I'll use, use some blocks and hopefully you all be able to see me um, and just sum up everything. I'll do some word changing here shortly. Um, and for those on the Zoom call, I'm going to utilize you as a reference of understanding. So once I finish, I will ask, does that make sense? And you all just be honest with me. And if not, I'll re-explain. So what I'm getting at is in the South, separate but equal looked like this right here. Black school in comparison to a white school. Whereas in Topeka, Kansas, they provided equal but separate, meaning these are the same size blocks. They're equal, but they were still separate. So with that people in, on my Zoom call, does that make sense to you all? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Michelle. So we'll keep going. And, and just to, to put it in perspective, we'll keep going and talk about some of the things that happened within the school. And then as mentioned, uh, think it, yeah, I think Michelle, I think I did ask you this, uh, or no, I think it might have been Amy or Nicole when I asked about the can separate but equal ever be equal. So whoever I ask, I'm, I'm coming back around for you here shortly. But just to put it in perspective, let's move inside the classroom. So within this all black school, Monroe School, as mentioned, the floors within this kindergarten room are actually original as well. And this is the one classroom that we have set up that is, was at a, a classroom. This was the actual kindergarten room within this school. And with that, kids would, it was it's set up just the way kids would have seen it back, uh, back in that time frame, T tables tailored to the size of the students. There would have been a table for the teacher to sit and observe, observe their class, teaching the ABCs, one, two, threes, all kind of things like that that you learn in kindergarten, but also things that you don't think about that you learn in kindergarten. So for those that are sitting in the Zoom call, whether it's Facebook, Zoom, whatever it may be, just something that you probably learned in kindergarten. If you just look down at your feet, whether you got on shoes, especially if you have on shoes, that shoes that have strings, I can almost guarantee you they're not untied because you learn things like this in kindergarten or basic things such as sharing. And I say that because as an only child myself, at home, playing with toys prior to preschool and kindergarten, those were my toys. Coming to kindergarten, those were still my toys, but I did have to learn how to share because I never was introduced to that. Sharing and manners, even as students are on Facebook Live, those things that you don't like your teacher saying when you say, hey, can I use the bathroom? And they hit you with, I don't know, can you? They're hoping that you're constructing a, a, a sentence and utilizing your manners in the proper way. All the things that people are learning right here in kindergarten. There would have been a piano in the kindergarten classroom because as a kindergarten teacher, you had to know how to play, play the piano before you step foot within that classroom as the teacher. And that's because music is and was an intricate part of learning. And I say that because even if you were to ask me right now, grown, grown up, I uh, haven't been in kindergarten in some years, but if you were to ask me to say my ABCs, I can guarantee you I would sing them instead of just saying them because music was and still is an intricate part of learning. That white thing right beside the, the piano was the state of the art heating system, meaning the one that you, the, the best that money could have bought at that time. And the one that you would have found in a white school, you found right here in a black school, kitchen set, books, blocks, Lincoln Logs, the whole shebang, even a fireplace within the kindergarten room. And, and speaking about that kind of stuff, the fireplace within itself, just being in a kindergarten is a kindergarten room is a, a weird thing to have there. Um, so question would be why in the world did they have a fireplace in a kindergarten room? And with that, much like, uh, I don't know if she recalls, but, but I definitely do. Uh, Katie, I told you during our first meet, I said, I'll save one question for you specifically. I remember. <laughs> call. Do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> Perfect, and I, and I stopped you from answering. So with that, why do you think there's a fireplace within the kindergarten? And I did no, no research or anything, but my <laughs> gut instinct is that um, it's very aesthetically pleasing and they're making a nice environment for the students. What, what makes you say that? Because fireplaces are, you know, I equate them with, you know, a beautiful room uh -huh. and it gives off a nice ambiance and... 
Yeah, lit, unlit, which one? Lit. Okay, okay, so stay, stay, I stay. It's kind of sounding like a fire hazard more that I talk about it, but. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, let's challenge that a little bit, just a okay. little bit. And I say that because what if I told you it's never been used before? Because I don't know if you recall me saying the white thing right next to the piano was the state of the art heating system, meaning the best that money could have bought at that time. So the fireplace has never been used before, ever to our knowledge. Huh. So what is the fireplace for? Uh, to make the room look prettier? Make the room look prettier. Okay, okay. Well, here's what I'll do. And, and usually if, if I was in person, we'll, we'll go back and forth. I'll have you point people out, but I know time is of the essence. So what I'll do is bring something, and if you don't mind, I'll say personal, but much like I shared with you uh, when we first talked, I said, because I see what you have going on in life, I know I can be able to ask you this question, right? So, so with that, the little one that you were babysitting, right? Mm -hmm. How old she is? She is two. She's two. So meaning not preschool, not day or not not preschool, not kindergarten at all, right? Right. All right. But just knowing her, spending some time with her, let's get her to preschool or let's get her to kindergarten age, five, six, right? Okay. How do you think her very first day of kindergarten will go attitude wise? Just thinking of her. Oh, I think she'll be very excited and excited. Okay. Okay. Excited Does she have siblings? Sorry? Does she have siblings? She does. She has two older brothers. Two older brothers. And that makes sense. So, and I say that because more than likely she's going to be excited, happy because she gets to go to school like big brother, right? Mm -hmm. Big brothers. But let's talk about the oldest one in the bunch of the two big brothers. How do you think his very first day went attitude wise when he started kindergarten? Uh, I know he was very uh, scared. He was scared ah. to be home and kind of scared of the unknown. Man, absolutely, because he has nobody to look forward to going to school like. He's the trailblazer. I don't know who to right. keep for. That teacher could be the devil. Mom, dad, no longer here, correct? Yep. But where do you typically see a fireplace? In a living room. Which is where? At home. At home. And guess what that baby knows? He knew home, right? Yeah. Which calms him down a little bit because, and thinking about it, even talking about individuals, even on, the, on Facebook Live or right here in Zoom, me, I do not have a fireplace at home. So, so even with that, people say, well, I don't have a fireplace at home. Yeah, neither do I. But guess what? What, what, thinking about this conversation, why in the world did we just start talking about home? Fireplace. So with thinking about home, home generally is not scary, especially when you're not doing anything that gets you in trouble. Home generally is not scary. And thinking about a home right now because of this fireplace in this classroom, if this place has me thinking about home, maybe this place might not be so scary either. Does that make sense? Yeah. So thinking about that, that's just one thing they, they did within this school to make sure these kids were taken care of, but that didn't stop there. This school would have went K through eighth grade uh, until about 1941, so you got big kids walking around. With that, as a kindergartner, you're using, learning how to use the bathroom and, and making sure you need to go. However, thinking about those big kids in that classroom, man, I am not going out there to get trampled. It sounds like a stampede. So the, the school said, don't worry about it. That open door right there, that's just for you. You don't have to worry about going getting trampled. We got you taken care of. And then last but not least, to the left of that, uh, that flagpole that you can't, you can see the flag, but you can't see there's a door right there. That door over there is just for kindergartners to be able to enter in that classroom so they don't have to worry about coming into school with big kids. So saying all that, it just goes to show you within this all black school, yeah, these babies were taken care of, taken care of. However, thinking about this and this court case, um, and I think this was, I want to say, Amy, was it you or Nicole when I asked, could separate but equal can never be equal? Who did I ask? I think it was Amy. It was me. Oh, it was Nicole. Perfect. Nicole, here comes your challenge. Watch this. So thinking about this, we're going, to fast, uh, we're going to rewind about 67 years exactly, which will put us in 1954. Um, 1954 exactly, absolutely. And let's say we switched your career. So you no longer work for the, the National History Academy, none of that. You're now a lawyer, an attorney. You're, you're with Thurgood Marshall himself, a part of the, the, leader, uh, the, the legal defense team uh, or fund. 
NAACP, the whole span. You have six figures, your mama's taking care of all that good stuff. Buy all the money, like all the stuff you have want in the world you can buy. But Brown v. Board ends up on your desk and you're hit with the reality of Topeka, Kansas, where they provided equal but, but separate. How do you legally prove that even though it looked like this right here in Topeka, Kansas, that this too was still absolutely unequal and unfair. How do you prove it? Does that question make sense for you, Nicole? It makes sense. I think you also have to look at the outcomes and is just the fact of segregation creating an unequal situation where maybe within an individual classroom, it's not unequal, but once they leave that classroom, are they facing challenges as a result of segregation, segregation. being the rule? Absolutely. And, and we're talking about this. So I'll, I'll do, you hit, you go with you and I'll even probably challenge Bill here shortly. So talking about challenging and, and as those are listening to it on Facebook Live, you're going to be on the side, you're on the side of arguing and trying to change the face of the country, trying to get it to being desegregated within schools. Somebody has to be on the opposite side and try to challenge challenge you and keep it segregated, right? Yeah, that's going to be me. So if I was that lawyer, that attorney that was arguing this court case trying to keep segregation, I would say, yeah, they might have challenges that they may face out there in the real world, but guess what? That's not my problem. I deal with them here in school. So within school, guess what? They're taken care of. So what I would tell you is that lawyer that was trying to keep segregation, stop your complaining. How do you prove that separate but equal can never be equal? Bill, talk to me. Let's say it's it's inherently unequal. It's you know like Rosa Parks sitting Rosa Parks sitting at the back of the bus. She's sure. always a, she she had to sit at the back of the bus. It's the same bus. It's the same seat. But then you know if it fills up with white people, she had to stand up. Um, yeah. You know, and then you look at you look at the education system, and um, you know it might be the same building, the same supplies, but um, you know what are we trying to create as a society? Uh, once those students graduate from that you know, so-called separate but equal school, then you know what are their opportunities coming out of it? Are we just going to create two separate societies? You know, it, it, makes, it makes zero sense. Man, absolutely. However, here's what I'll say: prove it. And I say that because we're talking about Rosa Parks before we even get to Rosa Parks, because Rosa Parks is in the 60s. You got to get past Brown v. Board first. And, and I'll, I'll double back to why I'm saying that, right? But prove it. And I say that because, for instance, places like Tuskegee University, HBCU, right? You got Hampton, you got Howard, you got Spelman, you got Morehouse. Go to one of those schools. See how that works? Mm -hmm. Yes. Prove how this is unequal or unfair. Yeah, it's. Uh, if, I was gonna say, if you want to keep going, that's, feel free to do it. However, Amy, I'm coming to you next, and then I then I'll kind of keep moving. Same question. Yes, ma'am. How do you prove? Um, I think um, maybe you also look at the effects on uh, individuals over time, and so mm. you okay. have to. Okay. So thinking about. Um, I mean, today we talk a lot about social emotional health, but how does that impact social emotional health for students who do, um, who are quote unquote separate but equal <laughs> um, and being able to also challenge for opportunities um, provided for students going through separate but equal um, and trying to, to show those sides. Okay, Amy, I love that answer. So I'm gonna back away from you with that specific question, but I'm gonna jump on you with another. As you can see, whether it's through, <clears throat> excuse me, through Bill, whether it's through Nicole, this is a little challenge. So here's what I'll ask you another question. Why in the world did they use Kansas to change the face of this country forever? And I say that because a lot of people don't realize that this court case actually consisted of five different court cases throughout this you had a court case that came out of Washington, D.C., so right there where some of you all are. You have a court case that came out of Delaware, Virginia, South Carolina, and Kansas. 
So out of all those places, I, I showed you South Carolina. South Carolina looked like trash. Virginia, the classrooms were so packed within the black schools that they were having classes in school buses just to compensate for some of those classes that were packed within the black schools. So why in the world did they use Kansas to change the face of the country forever? Amy, why do you think that? If I'm not mistaken, I think um, each case brought some other element that needed to be challenged. And Kansas was the, the ex example of um, two schools that did have closest to separate but equal. And so this was um, a way to challenge that even though, quote unquote, it was separate but equal, it was not separate but equal. And so that was the other way to pull, pull and prove the court case. Okay, Amy. Okay, absolutely. So, and, and what I'll do is I'll explain it just to make sure everybody gets it. So, what you're what, essentially what Amy's getting at is what you're trying to do is hit integration, closest thing to to greatness when it comes to the school uh, school district. What you have from Kansas, they're they're all right. They have their issues, but in comparison to the rest of the country, they look pretty good. The rest of the country, including the other four court cases, look like garbage in comparison. However, if they would have utilized a court case, whether it's Washington, D.C., Delaware, Virginia, or South Carolina, what they're going to do is do exactly what I've been doing this entire time, providing excuses and money. Well, they don't have any books in South Carolina. Well, give them the same books and the exact same resources. We're moving up our scale. Well, they don't have any uh, uh, funding. The funding doesn't look the same. Give them the exact same amount of funding. Well, their teachers are not even qualified to teach in the South. Give them teachers with, with master's degrees and PhDs. Starting to sound familiar. It's starting to sound like Kansas. But remember on our scale, I didn't ask you for another Kansas. I said, let's try to hit greatness or at least close to it. So two things it shows. There was something between Kansas and greatness that was absolutely wrong. You just got to prove it, hence the question. The other thing it shows is if you use anything other than a Kansas, all they're going to do is throw money at it and tell you to make it look like Kansas. But if we already have a Kansas, let's not waste time doing this mess right here. Let's start here and try to change the face of the country forever. So with that, what I'll do is keep going, um, but start to speed up. But usually what I'll say is providing a, uh, some methods to my madness. And within a uh, 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 actual face-to-face time in which to do this, or if we had more time, I would push more. But the reason I'm doing this is because if you know anybody over the age of 67 years old, they are older than this court case. They're older than this court case. So with that, just imagine, thinking about Thurgood Marshall and his team, imagine what they had to go through throughout this entire court case. I'm sure it was tough, hard, frustrating. They had to jump so many hoops, it wasn't even funny. But just imagine if they gave up because it got hard. Just imagine if they gave up because it got tough. Something as simple as literally being able to do this right here. As a black man on this call, this wouldn't have happened within a society because segregation would have still been legal. So with that, the reason I push is because they pushed. They kept fighting to change the face of the country so you and I and everybody that's on this call could see it how it is today. And we'll get to some of that here shortly as far as what it is today, but I do want to move forward. One thing that they had as a challenge against them, Thurgood Marshall and his team, they have to have witnesses. You have to have people to testify for you. Within this court case, not one black teacher from Topeka, Kansas agreed to testify. They actually said no, but for three amazing reasons, if I say so myself. The very first reason being a letter from the superintendent of the school board letting black teachers know that if they were to integrate schools and desegregate them, as a black teacher, you will not teach my white students. You're gonna have to find something else to do. That's even with your master's degree, even with your PhD, you will not <coughs> teach white kids. So that's the first reason. Second reason, as I show you that classroom within itself, fireplace, side rooms or side doors, all the, the whole shebang. As a teacher, prove to me that my babies are going to be better taken care of over there at a white school than they already are right here at this all black school. And then last but not least, as some of the people within our Zoom call even hinted to, as a black teacher, as a black teacher, they see themselves, the students, they see themselves within me. 
But if you were to remove self from this classroom and you will put someone else before them that's not going to face those same adversities that they're going to face out there in that real world, people say that they can't, they won't, they don't belong, and they never will. By me standing before them, it shows them they can, they will, and my babies are just next. But if you remove me from this classroom, who stands before them to show them just that? So for three amazing reasons, not one black teacher agreed to testify. But with that, it keeps the question the exact same, but that much harder. When your teachers won't even testify for you, then how do you prove that this is still unequal and absolutely unfair? So with that, Nicole, you hit it right on the head, <clears throat> or excuse me, not Nicole, Amy, you were hitting it right on the head talking about that social science. So what they ended up doing was interviewing, they got psychologists um, out of South Carolina and wanted to see what were the effects of segregation. Yes, you can do all this with the tangibles, but how is it messing with people mentally? So what they ended up doing was interviewing over 200 students, both black and white, and presented them two separate baby dolls. And the only thing that was different between the two dolls was the skin color. And they began to ask questions. And for some, they, some of you, as I'm talking, some of you all might say, oh, this sounds like the brown eyes, blue eyes, which is Jane Elliott. Who do you think she got the test from? So you're thinking about the same thing, just hers is within college after this study had been done in 1954 or put made a part of this study in 1954 to take up to the Supreme Court. But with the, the, those dolls, they began to ask questions. Which one's the pretty doll? Which one's the, the ugly one? The smart one, the dumb one, the nice one, the mean one. And then last but not least is which doll looks more like you? What they realized is all the, all the positive things went to that of the white doll and all the negative things went to, all the black, to the black doll. And that was from both groups of students, both black and white. But when it came to that very last question, that question of which doll looks more like you, most of the black students either hesitated or refused to answer that question for good reason. I just told you all the negative things about a doll that looks like me and now you want me to identify with it? Yeah, this ain't rocket science, no. So what it showed them is no matter how you did segregation, whether if it was as subtle as it looked right here in Topeka, Kansas, or if it was as horrible as it looked in the South, psychologically it was detrimental to both. Someone's gonna see themselves as superior. Because I can, because you can't, because you have to do, I must be a little better. It makes sense. Where the other group's gonna see themselves as inferior. Because I can't, because they can, because I have to. Yeah, what's wrong with me? So when you're able to present all that to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court rules in favor and begins to ask this question, the segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of races deprive children of minority groups of an equal educational opportunity. And they believed it does. Which got them to the verdict of, we conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal, which afforded them to change the face of the country forever. However, with this court case and the technicalities behind it, and it's literally within that last sentence, 1954 changed the face of the country forever within schools. However, that's the only thing that it desegregated. It says separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. However, what they utilized Brown v. Board as was a stepping stone or a foundational base and even talking about what Bill said as far as Rosa Parks, your Martin Luther King, your Malcolm X's, they looked back here and said, man, if we can win it right here, the rest of the country better watch out because we're coming to change it all. And they hit us with that 1964 Civil Rights Act that then desegregated the face of the country forever. But in order to get to that, you have to have your Brown v. Board first and with that, that's how they changed the face of the country forever to allow us to get to where we are today. Now, the last thing I'll mention with that before I wrap things up, man, <clears throat> we've come a long way. They got us to where we are and we're standing on the backs of giants to get us literally to where we are right here, right now, whether it's having conversations amongst one another, just me and this call, standing on the backs of giants. But the scary thing is, is they've done their part we too are gonna be considered to be giants one day. And 67 years from now, individuals are gonna be looking back at us and they're gonna say one of two things. They're gonna say, man, you guys saw some of those issues, you did your part and we'll take it from here. Or 
what in the world were y'all doing? What they say about us is going to be completely up to us. It's going to be tough, hard, frustrating. You might want to give up. You might want somebody to give you the answers, much like I'm sure that they went through within this court case. But if they can figure it out, so can we. So you can always look back at Brown v. Board because, yet again, if they can figure it out, so can we. So with that, thank you very much for including me. And I think we will take questions from here and feel free to ask any questions, whether it's talking about through Facebook chat or here's my contact information, feel free to let me know how I can help you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Dexter. And we do have got some questions. We'll see how many we can get in in uh, this time frame. Uh, first of all, going back right at the beginning of uh, your presentation, John asked, can you pick the sites that you work at when working for the National Park Service? Absolutely. So each, great question. Each National Park site that you work at or that you that I've had the opportunity to work at or anybody has the opportunity, we definitely get the opportunity to pick. Uh, there, so what I'll say is also with that, National Park Service is a very tough job to get into. Um, and I say that because everybody's trying to get to those great places. You have 420 parks um, or 420 plus parks. However, within those, depending on the time in which they're hiring, uh, some parks might be taking 30 people um, as far as new hires and seasonal people and things like that. Uh, so it's easier to come in. And I say it that way because if I was a hiring official, I might hire 15 people that have some experiences and then 15 people that are fairly new to this thing. That's in the summertime. However, in the wintertime, yeah, visitation slims down, so, so does my staff. So I might only need one person. And with that, as a seasonal in those five parks I listed, at one time I was a seasonal in those five parks, I did within two years and 10 months. So on paper, John, if you've never had a experience working in the National Park Service, have any federal experience under your belt, on paper, going against one position, essentially I will eat you alive on paper because I have more experience and things like that. So it's a tough field to get into, but yes, we get to pick every single part that we go to. Great question. <clears throat> Robin asked, how far do the children have to travel to get to school, uh, the African-American children have to travel to get to school versus the white children? Great question, Robin. So what I'll say is it depended on where you were at. So within the South, a lot of them were walking miles, five, seven, even 10 miles, and that was just one way to get to school. Um, then you had to turn around and come home. Topeka, Kansas, it was a little different. It just depended on where you were at. So we'll use Linda Brown as the example for namesake of the court case. Linda Brown was the person who the court case is actually named after. She went to Monroe School, which is the school that we work in. Uh, Monroe School from her house was essentially 21 blocks, which equates to two miles. So it just depended on where you stay. There was also a comment in the chat um that the number of students per class per teacher were larger for the African-American schools in Delaware compared to the white schools. Was this standard practice? So I, I was about to say, I can't say standard. However, it's not, it's not um, what's the word I want to say? Um, not anything surprising. I'll say it that way. Uh, not anything surprising. So yet again, it depended on where you were at, but much like whether it's Delaware, South Carolina. So let's say, let's say, yes, it was standard. The exception was places like Kansas. So those were the surprises of, huh, I didn't realize people did it here, did it this way here in comparison to the norm or the, the standard that I'm used to where it's overcrowded within black schools. So, so yes, it was a standard. How was the Brown versus Board of Education decision received across the country at first? Man, a lot of my questions are gonna be, depends on where you're at. Um, however, yet again, talking about a standard throughout the country, man, um, fight, 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 whether it was directly or indirectly. So I'll, I'll keep it simple. Uh, places like your Little Rock Nine, which is in Arkansas, where if, if you know anything about that, there's this nine black students in 1957 that had to be escorted by National Guard because people were saying, hey, we're not going to integrate. So President Eisenhower had to federalize the, the National Guard to come escort them in. Or if you know about the Norman Rockwell picture with Ruby Bridges, that six-year-old child that had to get escorted in by, uh, U.S. Marshals, 
that's that's two different places. You have places like Alabama with Governor George Wallace that was saying segregation now and segregation forever. So it just depended on where you're going. That's the direct things. You have places like Virginia that was a part of the court case. And instead of integrating their schools, what they did something was kind of secret, but but not want to say secret. It was more of a behind the scenes, but legal but came down to the same verdict. So what they did end up doing, instead of integrating their schools, what they ended up doing was providing money voucher to students that went to that school, which were white, closing down the public schools, and then opening up private schools. Now, once they opened up those private schools, they charged money for that. With that, the white students had the money because they just gave them money vouchers, and then said, hey, anybody, and on that, with that, that's completely legal. Hey, Anybody can come to my school. Anybody, you can come to my school. You just gotta pay for it. But if I'm that that school district person or whatever, as as black individual, I know that you're not gonna have the money to pay for my school. So whether you like it or not, I'm gonna keep my segregation. But until you can prove that I'm doing it duly to the or solely due to the color of your skin, I am completely within law because you don't have the money. Until then. You can't come to my school. So you had different ways of people kind of uh, uh, reacting to the court case as a whole. And so we are just about out of time. So maybe um, one final question. I do want to read some comments too in the chat at the end. There's just really wonderful comments coming in. Um, where was it? Uh, so thinking about separate but equal in current terms, would you say it's comparable at all to the wealth gap in schools today? Absolutely. So I'll, I'll say that and, and I'll keep the answer uh, broad or I'll keep it kind of concise. Um, absolutely. So so I'll say that due to the fact that a lot of people will speak to now it's a wealth gap compared to a racial gap. However, the thought process is how did we get there? So in order to get to that level, you can't just say it ended up that way due to money. You had so many different kind of program and processes and policies that kept the, the foot on the neck of black individuals from rising up within the country as a whole. And as those things got lifted up, it doesn't just equally or doesn't just uh, fix itself naturally. So you're gonna see those different kind of, well, it's, a, it's now a wealth gap, but at the end of the day, how did we get here? So absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dexter. And uh, just looking at some of the comments in the uh, chat, I did want to mention as well, we had some people saying that they were older than the actual decision and some even going to the first integrated schools in their area. So it's just remarkable to realize, you know, you learn this as history, but it wasn't that long ago. Absolutely. And, and if I could say, and I'll uh, make sure you have time, that's what usually puts it in perspective for me. So, and I say that just due to the fact that, as I mentioned, 1964 is when things legally as a whole, that's when segregation ended as a whole because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. However, thinking about it and what puts it in perspective, my mom was born in 1962. That means my mother was born before the Civil Rights Act of 64. She was born before the Voting Rights Act of 65. She was born before interracial marriages was legal in 67, born before Martin Luther King got shot in 68, born before Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon. I can go home to North Carolina and hug my mom. That puts it in perspective how close this foolishness was and to think that my mama could have lost her life because of it. So absolutely, absolutely. And that's, what, so that's why I keep trying to make sure as people say, this happened so long ago. No, if you know anybody over the age of 67 by itself, they're older than the court case. But if you know anybody before 64, they're older than segregation, legal segregation coming to an end. So absolutely. Wow, think about. Well, Dexter, thank you again so very much for being with us today, teaching us more about Brown versus Board of Education and helping us have this important conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for having me. And, and much like I said, this is where we have hard conversations. So please, let me know how we can help. Let us know how we can help. This is what we're here for. So thank you again for having us. Great, thank you. And everyone watching, um, you, Dexter's uh, contact information is up on the screen. So feel free to reach out.
And I just thank you again for being with us today and be sure to join us here next week, Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern time for a virtual visit with Seneca Falls. And for all those high school and middle school students out there, anyone interested in more history and civics education opportunities for the summer, be sure to check out our summer programs on our website at nationalhistoryacademy.org and have a wonderful rest of your day.